I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this wait, wait, wait. I'm Sarah Canada. And I'm Cheryl Bernard. And this isn't Talking Points. All right, now hold on. We were getting to that. We didn't say it was Talking Points, did no, we? No, but we are happy to have Children's Ministry yes, with us today. You. And we're here to talk about an important, exciting Sabbath school training event coming up in the near future. We're calling it Sunday School for Sabbath School. Hold on, let me guess. It's on Sunday. It <laughs> is on a Sunday. You're right. And what are we covering? We're going to talk about all aspects of Sabbath school work for all divisions, from adults all the way down to youth and children, all the way down to crater roll. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is see all Sabbath school divisions be quality and be part mm -hmm. of every local church and part of their mission to grow the church yes. and make it a healthy, thriving community. Now that's right here in Lansing, isn't it, Sarah? That's right. It's Sunday, March 5th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's an absolutely free event with lunch provided. Lunch provided. Can't you go can't wrong. can't beat that, right? Lunch provided for no other reason. Show up for the good food. <laughs> and you can register for this event at www.michigansspm.org. When you get to there, you go to the homepage, and there's going to be a banner that says Sunday School for Sabbath School. Click on that, and that'll take you to a registration page. Or you can register at our website, <laughs> mystickids.org. So we're really looking forward to this event. We want as many people registered as possible. So sign up today and we'll see you there. I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. This quarter, our entire study is about titled Managing for the Master. It's all about financial mm -hmm. stewardship. And this week, the title is Unto the Least of These. Obviously, this is going to be focusing on ministry to the poor. That's right. So, Well, you know, the memory verse is in Matthew 25. And, and when we refer to that, unto the least of these, my brethren, if you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it to me. Mm -hmm. We know it's, it's broader than just ministry to the poor, but because our lesson is on financial stewardship, mm -hmm. this lesson especially zeroes in on that aspect of Matthew 25. So. Exactly. You know, we'd already talked about in our little pre-discussion as well, that could apply in this way, in this way, in this way. Right. And you're right, it could, but specifically we're looking at that. Yeah. And so in your class, as you're teaching your class, obviously it will probably broaden a little bit, but there's plenty to talk about in ministry to the poor that maybe we don't usually talk about. So that's, right. that's where our focus is this week. Well, I tell you what, uh, you put the talking points together, so let me have a word of prayer, then you can walk us through the lesson. All right. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of knowing you and ministering to those whom you love as well, especially in the case of the poor, as we're going to study this week. Help us to know what it means, help us to know what your word directs for us, and help us to have a conversion of heart so that we will uh, treat all people as Jesus would. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, as you pointed out, lesson Sabbath afternoon, last paragraph says, this week's lesson focuses on ministry to the poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my three talking points from this week are, number one, ministry to the poor was part of Christ's mission, mm. uh, the mission of the Messiah. We're going to see that uh, from largely from Sunday's lesson. Okay. Talking point number two, uh, this obviously follows ministry to the poor is a Christian duty. If our master <laughs> was, this was part of his mission, it should be part of our mission. Yeah, I don't know what we would expect otherwise. Like Jesus right. did it, but you've got a different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so Monday and Thursday is where that is drawn from. And then finally, number three, ministry to the poor rounds out Christian character. Mm. And that's taken primarily from Tuesday and Wednesday. That's an lesson. interesting thought. So. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Ministry to the poor was a part of Christ's mission. Okay, we should probably start out. Why don't you turn to Isaiah 61? Uh, the lesson bases a lot on this as we're looking at the, prof the prophecy of, of Isaiah in Isaiah 61, uh, quoted by Christ in Luke chapter 4. Okay. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Sure. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. I'm turning the whole time I'm turning it like, like you, you know, you, you, our church members do that sometimes. They turn there and you're like, uh, you've noticed that preaching and then finally you get done with it. It's like, anyway, I've let's go to the had, next text. I've, I've actually preached and I've had people say, you know, when they, they get there and I finish the text and they go like this. <laughs> so, well, anyway, we could, we could implement happens. the same and when you it get there. It happens to thing. all of us, <laughs> right. So, um, the ministry, you know, this is a, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. In fact, mm -hmm. 
because the Lord has anointed me. One of the questions a lesson asked is, how do we know this is about the Messiah? Because the word the Messiah means the anointed one. Mm -hmm. And he, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed. Well, and also Jesus, Jesus himself <laughs> said, this is me. <laughs> quotes it. In Luke well, 4. you know, the question, yeah. yeah. And so in Luke chapter 4, as Jesus gets up to read in the temple, he reads this passage, and then he closes the scroll, and he says, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So, like, it's pretty inescapable. What's he trying to say? So, yeah. yeah. So the point here is that it's a messianic prophecy of Isaiah that Jesus applies to himself, and a very clear part of that ministry, as it's foretelling the work of the Messiah, mm -hmm. was ministry to the poor. Now, as we were talking in preparation, this was not the expected work of the Messiah. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Well, you see so many times where, you know, there's the wealthy versus the poor construct uh, in the New Testament, and that's kind of a, that's a friction point. Yeah. It, you have the wealthy who are extolling well, how, how great, God, exactly, God has blessed the, you with physical health and right. financial wealth, and those who are, might be sick or might be poor, well, clearly the Lord hasn't blessed. In fact, whenever we, the man born blind is yeah. like, who sinned? Was it right. their first thought is this is the displeasure the of God. Of God. Exactly. Right. So why is the Messiah going to minister to them? Right. So the idea of God being interested and in particularly ministering to the poor was kind of odd at that time. So that was so ingrained in their thinking that even again, uh, uh, John the Baptist was led to question mm. whether he was the Messiah because his work didn't match that coming in and conquering the Romans or what have you. So yes. what's fascinating is this same passage is referred to in Luke 7 by Christ when the disciples of John are sent to him and John, I, I'm, of all things, John says, go and ask him, are you the one or do we look for another? And you know, it's interesting. I've always thought it was interesting about that passage. He says, are you the one? And the easiest thing for Jesus would be like, yes. Right. Go tell him yes. But the, he needed something more than just a verbal like that's conference because right. that's, that's what a scoundrel would say. That's what a liar yeah. would say. So Jesus, instead of giving the verbal answer, he's like, he doesn't say anything. In fact, if you look at the text, he just starts ministering and then says, now go tell him what right. you've seen. That's right. And it matches up with scripture. As they see what he's done, he says, you go tell John that you've seen this, 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 and this. Right. And the wording he uses is straight Lifted. from Isaiah. Exactly. And when John hears it, John recalls the passage. Yep, this is, this is despite what the religious leaders say the Messiah is supposed to do, this, this is, is what, what scripture, scripture said exactly. he would do. And that affirms... Uh, his ministry, his messiahship. In fact, there's a quote here from Desire of Ages 217, if you want to read that. Sure. Uh, it says, the evidence of his divinity was seen in its adapt adaptation to the needs of suffering humanity. The disciples bore the message, speaking of taking back to John. Right. This and his is commenting himself. directly on the disciples of John, now right. going back and telling. And you got to understand, in John's experience, he's languishing in prison, about to face right. death, and he's reviewing have I given myself over to a complete, right. you know, he's really, Lunatic. yeah. But the disciples bore the message and it was enough. John recalled the prophecy concerning the Messiah, referring to Isaiah That's 61, right. 1 and 2. Well, and then Ellen White actually quotes Isaiah 61, right. 1 and 2, which I've left out of the. But the works of Christ not only declared him to be the Messiah, but showed in what manner his kingdom was to be established. So not only for Christ, it just happened to be the one for him, but it actually is the principle of his entire kingdom. He was showing who he was and what his kingdom was all about. That's right. Yeah. So ministry to the poor is an integral part of the ministry of Christ. I mean, you can't separate it. You can't take it out. It, you can't overlook it. Mm -hmm. And obviously then if ministry to the poor was part of Christ's, or I could even say the Christ, the Messiah's mission, then ministry to the poor you would expect to be part of our mission and a Christian duty. And mm. so that's talking point number two. Now we take that again from Monday and Thursday primarily. Monday's lesson is all about God's provisions to the poor. It has us reading uh, Leviticus 23.22 and Deuteronomy 15. Deut mm. uh, Leviticus 23.22 where God is giving, and I'm just going to tell you, do a word search in whatever computer uh, uh, Bible app you're using or the good old-fashioned concordance, <laughs> yeah. and you look at poor and ministry of the poor, or Nave's topical Bible or something, and the Bible's full yes. of direction that God gave in making sure the needs of the poor were met. And you could say, as we talked about before, well, I mean, there's all kinds of poverty. There's, there's you know, emotional poverty or spiritual poverty and people who are... 
And mm -hmm. while that may be true in a broader sense, yes. you can't escape that they're talking about actual daily needs right. of people who are, did not have enough money. Right. When and the stuff. Lord is saying, <laughs> you know, when you glean, when you when you harvest your fields, leave something behind for the poor. This is not the spiritual. Exactly. It's like for the poor in spirit <laughs> who just need encouragement. No, this is actual food. You and know? so you have, and I have this outline to hear or noted in our outline that uh, throughout Scripture, God enjoins upon His people a responsibility to the poor. He gives instruction to leave behind a part of the harvest to glean. Again, Leviticus. Exodus 23:22, Exodus 23:10 and 11 are examples mm -hmm. of that. Uh, to provide for the poor from their abundance, mm. uh, Deuteronomy 15:11 says the poor. Uh, how's it worded? It, I'm, I think the poor will always be with you. That was Jesus' version yeah. of it. But oh, the poor will never um, go out from the land or something. I, I forget exactly the phraseology. Okay. I, I'll, in fact, let me look that up because I hate. Forgetting the phraseology. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to have you look up uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 13, and 14. And this sure. is where the Lord is encouraging that we help provide for the poor out well, While of, you're looking out that of our one up, abundance. why don't I go to 2 Corinthians? Oh, you have it right there? I have it now. Right? I said, yeah. uh, this is Paul writing, of course, for I do not mean that others should be uh, eased and you burdened, but, verse 14, by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack, that their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be inequality. So there's yes. clearly an idea of we need to share and share alike. And you know, if within, you have an abundance and somebody doesn't, then share help with them. them. Yeah, and 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 it works both ways. Yeah. So you know, and the Bible has all kinds of counsel like this. What I was looking at, the wording I was looking for, Deuteronomy 15:11, for the poor will never cease from the land. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus' words in the New Testament were, "You will always have the poor, the poor with will always you, be with right? you." Yeah. Uh, which we're going to look at in a little bit. So they were to leave behind part of their harvest. They were to provide for the poor from their abundance. They were to defend the poor from injustice. Mm. Uh, the Bible talked about defending the poor and the fatherless and the widow, mm. but the poor were included in that. So there's a lot of counsel in regard to the poor. Now, what's interesting is that beyond that, the blessing or curse of God mm. was and is in relation to our ministry to the poor. For example, why don't you look at Proverbs 22.9. And I'll go to Proverbs 28, 27. Proverbs 22, 9 says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Okay, so he's going to be blessed because he gives to the poor. Now, mm -hmm. Proverbs 28, 27, He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes, in other words, hides his eyes from the needs of the poor, will have many curses. Okay, so, the inverse of that, yeah. so it's not like help the poor out, but if you don't, oh well. The Lord yeah. is very clear here that you're going to be blessed if you help the poor. If it's almost poor, written in covenantal language. It's part of the expected duty of the Christian life is you're going to help those in need to help the poor in this instance. That's exactly right. In fact, in Ezekiel 16, now this one struck me. I've, I've used this text many times. The Bible talks about the sin of Sodom. And it just, this part didn't hit me until I was going through this lesson where he talks about in Ezekiel 16, 49, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. And a lot of times I've emphasized that to say more than just homosexuality, which mm -hmm. was a sin in Sodom, that this was, this was a, you know, it was a d this deeper, whatever else. But the last part says, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. That's right. And so, you know, nobody, when you look at Sodom in the Bible, you know the curse of God was upon Sodom. Right. Well, this is one of the major reasons for it. So it's interesting. Uh, again, the point there is that the blessing or curse of God is in relation to our ministry to the poor. He yeah. blesses those who bless the poor and he curses those who, who don't. don't help yeah. the poor. In and, fact, you have Job in there yeah. as one of the references. And so I went ahead and looked that up. In Job twenty nine yes. sixteen, it talks about... Uh, he says, I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know. Mm -hmm. And I know some versions talk about, well, the person you don't know, Such that's a stranger. The case, or, well, the case I did not know, and some say the case of him I did not know. Right. You know, so it would be a stranger outside of Israel, like Job was interested in everybody. But either way. Regardless, the point is he was proactive in his approach to dealing exactly with right. those in need. He would look for cases he could help. He would. He wasn't afraid. He didn't know a stranger. He would look to, for, right. for people to help out. And... and he didn't wait, wait for somebody coming along, or he didn't wait to went into the store and somebody's banging on a, like, fine, uh, okay, a bell. He's like, fine, okay, some loose change, but he, he, he yes. was strategic with it. He put things ahead of time. He would look for opportunities. He would seek out the stranger, and that's commendable. That's one of the things that's a good thing, right? In fact, yeah, our lesson brings that out. Uh, Thursday, Thursday's lesson, paragraph four, 
says, um, perhaps what's most insightful here are Job's words, and I searched out the case I did not know. In other words, Job didn't simply wait, for instance, for some beggar in rags to approach him for a handout. Instead, Job was proactive in seeking out needs and then acting on them. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's something similar to spiritual poverty, too. We shouldn't wait for people to say, hey, could I have right. a Bible study? You're supposed to look for opportunities. Right. And the same thing, temporal help, too. If there are those in need, you should not be like, man, that'd be bad. If, if they came by, I'd probably help them out. No, be right. more active in it, proactive, as Job was. In fact, that's the exact counsel. I think you have that mm -hmm. note there in uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. Yes. It's also in Thursday's quarterly. It says, do not wait for them, that is the poor, to call your attention to their needs. Act as did Job. The thing that he knew not, he searched out. Go on an inspecting tour and learn what is needed and how it can be best supplied. So I found, I found that really interesting. <laughs> the wording there, tour. like Sister White says, go on an inspecting tour. Go around and start touring around to see who you can help. Now yeah, and I really, wonder, that, what, what, what would an inspecting tour be, look like? You know, yeah. would it be within your own household, or your extended family? Would it be your church family? Would it be your neighborhood, your community? And I guess all of them yes. count. Exactly. It's like there's not <laughs> one that's bad. So just start touring around and look for needs. <laughs> and, and that should not be a novel idea. You know, when I read that, I thought, oh, interesting. Well, it shouldn't be like, oh, interesting. Like, that should be like, yeah, that's what I do all the time. Yeah, it's sad that a light and bulb so, came on. <laughs> yes, it really is. But that's why we have these lessons, Amen. folks. Amen. Uh, we can all learn something. That's why well, it's called Sabbath school. Exactly. And it flows so nicely into talking point number three. It sure does. Where ministry to the poor rounds out Christian. Is it possible you can be a, a devoted Christian, maybe even a leader in the church, and still have some aha moments like, you know what? Well, that's a flat spot in my character. I really need to So let me with. back up on why that last one was a little bit of an aha, too. Okay. We tend to do this where we have... Praise the Lord for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the way that it's set up. Like we have, one of the things mm. that we have in our churches is our Adventist community services. Mm. That regularly helps the needs of the poor. And the reality is this, folks. When you give to the combined budget of your local church, you're giving to every ministry of the church, including that ministry, and you're helping the poor. Mm. And my point is you can do that, or you may have some other thing that you give to an address or something like that. And in your mind... You may think, I give to the poor. Yeah, I already do that. Mm. And and so sometimes we can allow that to, to almost become a substitute for the personal effort of going on this inspecting tour, mm. you know, and seeking out the needs where I can personally minister to people. So oh. we talk about this in personal ministries all the time because it, it's... Corporate ministries can easily become a substitute, an attempted substitute. I have to read this quote. It's killing me that you're basically <laughs> quoting a verbatim. It's this Christian service, page 10. It's Ellen yes. Elswell here. She says, everywhere there's a tendency to substitute the work of organizations for individual effort. Mm -hmm. You want me to keep reading? Yeah, that's yeah, exactly do. what I was thinking about. <laughs> Human when... wisdom tends yeah. towards consolidation, to centralization, the building up of great churches and institutions. Multitudes leave to institutions and organizations the work of benevolence. That's the mm -hmm. doing of good for others. They excuse themselves from contact with the world and their hearts grow cold. Mm. They become self-absorbed and unimpressible. Love for God and for man dies out of his soul. Christ commits to his followers an individual work, a work that cannot be done by proxy. Now, I want to be clear before we finish this statement. There's nothing wrong with institutions. Pro I work for an proxy institution. Proxy means somebody else is doing it in right. your place. Right, and we should give to those. There's nothing yes. wrong with charities and organizations and institutions. But if that becomes the substitute for individual, that's where the problem is. She goes on to say, Ministry to the sick and the poor, the giving of the gospel to the lost, is not to be left to committees or organized charities. Mm -hmm. Not to be left to. It, it can be done by them, but not left right. to them, Right. Individual like responsibility, part, individual effort, personal sacrifice, yes, and here's it is, is the requirement of the gospel. It's not the suggestion. It's not the recommendation. It's the requirement. Mm. Talking point number two, folks. Ministry to the poor is a Christian duty. Amen. Okay. Amen. And that is a, where was that found again? That was Christian, Christian service, service, page 10. Page 10. And that is a beautiful segue because mm -hmm. it, it said in there that if if you don't what have happens that personal to your, involvement, yeah. that love dries... Do, yeah. What does it say? Dries out of the heart? They, no, it says uh, their dies, hearts, their hearts grow the cold. Heart. They become self-absorbed and unimpressible. Love for God and, and man, for man dies, dies out, out of the of heart. The soul. Yeah. So talking point number three, ministry to the poor rounds out Christian character. Mm. Now, Jesus was clear that we will always have the poor with us. Yep. And we've, lo we've looked at that a little bit. 
Uh, Matthew 26, 11 is where he says that. Deuteronomy 15, 11, the poor won't go out of the land, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this begs the question, why doesn't God cure poverty? Like, yeah. it, how could Jesus say the poor, you'll always have the poor? Why would he say that? Like so many other of the ills of society, it must be that God permits it. You know, God doesn't want people to be in poverty. Mm. God permits it for a greater good. In other words, well, we've seen it, this, put yeah. it this way. God wants to see, God gives an abundance to some. There is enough wealth in this world that nobody needs to be in poverty. Right. And so, you were going to say? Well, I think that's interesting too because, I mean, there's other examples in other contexts. I think of Lazarus, right? Lazarus needed to be healed. Yeah. But he purposely waited and he explains why. He said, because I needed them to believe. I needed to, there's a mm-hmm. broader purpose to, but on okay. the surface, Mary and Martha are like, why didn't you fix it? He's like, you don't understand. This is a bigger thing. It's going to be better than it. And the same thing we could say for poverty and all the ills mm. of society. Couldn't God just snap his finger, fix it all, and we're all done? Well, not really, because if the goal is to build character and work through people, mm. it, it's, it's an agency for helping them and us at the same time. Well, think about this for a minute. If we all had a, a, a perfect Christ-like character, you know, totally sure. unselfish, poverty wouldn't exist. That would be done. It simply wouldn't exist. Which is, that's kind of an aha to me. Like, I, you know, what I was going to say here is God uses, he has allowed poverty to test our characters. But, but it just dawns on me that if we were like Christ, we wouldn't be content to have all an abundance while somebody else was in need. Mm. It, which is where, you know, yeah. you read that passage in, in uh, 2 Corinthians. So, or 1 Corinthians. So, notice this statement. In fact, why don't you read this statement? Now, there's a statement that I've got in here. Why don't you read it, and then I'll comment on it. Sure. This comes from uh, uh, Signs of the Times, October 14, 1889. It says, I once knew a woman whose husband was a drunkard, and she was obliged to wash for a living. She used to wish that she had riches so that she could help the cause. And the Lord tested her with the riches, but she did not remember the cause of God. She built a fine house and furnished it with every luxury, and kept promising herself that she would give to the cause as soon as she had accomplished this or that. Notice the phraseology, the Lord tested her with riches. And I I could not find the story. I remember ironically reading about this woman, and I don't remember reading this quote. Mm. So when I was trying to find the story of the woman, I found this quote, but I couldn't find the other, so I wrote (laughs) to a friend at the White Estate. So where is this story again? Second Testimonies 268 to 288. So there's 20 pages of an account where Ellen White goes over the hardships of this woman with her drunk husband, mm-hmm. with, with uh, the poverty and how she was always faithful in her poverty. And she always said, oh, I wish I had more I could give to the cause of the Lord. And then finally the Lord permitted her to have more and it ruined her mm. spiritually. I mean, it's just, it's a fascinating uh, story. So Testimonies, Volume 2, pages 268 to 288. I'd encourage you to read that. So God allows poverty to test our characters. And we see an example of that in the experiences. Uh, Thursday's lesson, I'm sorry, Wednesday's lesson talks about Zacchaeus. And Tuesday's Mm -hmm. lesson talks about the rich young ruler, if I have that right. Did I reverse that? Yeah, Wednesday, Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus is interesting. Now, he had been, not only was he a tax collector, but tax collectors, almost across the board, were cheaters. He's like, but he was That's a bad one. one. Problems with Matthew and people <laughs> yeah. didn't like the fact that Levi Matthew invited him to be because they were cheaters. There was a reputation that they came they by honestly. They were aligned with the Romans and everything yeah. else. But when Zacchaeus met Jesus and experienced justification, mm-hmm. immediately you see a generosity born in that experience. Right. right. All of a sudden, he's like, "I'm going to repay fourfold. I'm going to." Are you looking well, at I'm just thinking, because I don't recall, but if I'm not mistaken, Jesus didn't outline, now I need you to do this and oh, this no. and this. The, the point no, was this is that spontaneous. That's exactly my point, is that he just, it just springs out of him, and he, there's a conscience that's been wearing on him, and he knows he's been doing wrong, and immediately he's like, I'm going to right the wrong, and I'm going to help this out, and the, out of this converted heart springs this I love for others. That. Could you try again? No, you can't. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Number five, and when Jesus saw, uh, this is 19, uh, Luke 19.5, the story of Zacchaeus. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's going to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. 
and to have taken anything from anyone by false accusation and restored to him fourfold. Mm. So this is spontaneous from Zacchaeus mm. because of that conversion experience. So I put in our notes that Zacchaeus had been a cheater, but evidenced that conversion makes a person generous. Mm -hmm. And I and you commented on that how Acts well, chapter two it, we see exactly that it reminds me of Acts church. chapter two. These people are like. They're convicted of their sin and they're given forgiveness. The gift of God is given to them when they, you know, declare their faith, they're baptized. And then it says, verse 44 uh, and 45 of Acts 2, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. There's that sharing, right? Mm -hmm. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all. An answer for that. <laughs> we have the answer. It's right here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So... I don't recall in the in the sermon on uh, the, of the day of Pentecost where Peter's like, "Here's how you prove that you're." It just they were converted, and immediately they're like, "We need to That's fix right. this. We need to help this." And they, there was a new heart. It's That's the right. evidence of conversion. Well, and so what's interesting then is when you look at the story of the rich young ruler, uh, and and this is a little spin that maybe I'm putting on this. You know, of course, you have the whole thing where Jesus says Jesus does specify to him, "Go sell to the poor." Uh, give all your good support and, and rest sell to the poor. Yeah, yeah. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Yeah. Um, Jesus' words to the rich young ruler showed that generosity keeps a person converted. So, and, and let me expound on what I mean mm. there. Zacchaeus had been a cheater, but evidence of conversion makes a person generous. But to keep that generosity, like why, why did God give that, this, this responsibility of giving to us? Like the whole idea of stewardship mm -hmm. is something that is to help to keep us generous. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus, he asked him, what must I do to enter life? Well, Jesus said, keep the commandments. Which ones? Well, da, 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 I do these all for my youth. Mm -hmm. And then his question was, what do I lack? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the lesson on Tuesday makes the point. What did Jesus mean to him when he said, if thou wilt be perfect? Now that's quoting from the King James. That word perfect in other translations is rendered complete. Mm -hmm. And it's an answer to the, what am I lacking? What am I missing? What is it that I need to be complete? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, if you need, if you will be complete, you need to give to the poor. Mm. Okay. So in, in, in what I'm drawing from that is completeness of character, right? Talking point number mm. three, ministry to the poor rounds out Christian character. That giving, uh, in the case of the rich young ruler, of course, it was he was he was covetous. And I told Cameron I can't get into this too much because the next lesson I'm working on, lesson nine, is all about covetousness. So we'll talk mm. more about it there. But this is just contrasting. They, they were both rich men, mm -hmm. um, but uh, that 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 conversion makes a person generous and the continual giving helps to keep a person generous. Yeah, I, I love it. This is another statement from Acts of the Apostles, now 550. It says, the completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. And, and just to say it springs constantly, you know the Christian life is a battle and a march. Mm -hmm. And they're always, the carnal nature is always fighting. Selfishness is always fighting. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, hey, I'm generous. Now I'm going to stay generous. Right. Uh, that doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily the case unless we keep close to the Lord and we continue right. to practice those. But Christian. it's no accident that those who are converted immediately that's exactly go to work right. helping others. It is an evidence of genuine connection with Christ when you want to be about his business and help others. That's right. So there's an, there's an awesome statement from Testimonies, Volume 3. It's actually in the teacher's comments from page 97, if you'd read that for sure. us. Sure. It says, I saw that in the providence of God that widows and orphans, the blind, the deaf, the lame, and persons afflicted in a variety of ways have been placed in close Christian relationship to his church. It is to prove his people and develop their true character. So here it's playing out like this exists. God's permitted it to work in us, that mm. work out the selfishness and work in that beneficence. Mm. This is why I have in the notes here, this is why James included ministry to the poor as part of pure and undefiled religion. Mm. To visit the poor and the widows and, yeah. and, and keep, keep oneself unspotted from, from the, the world. world. James one twenty seven, And so, you know, this... You, how can you call yourself a Christian, a Christian, a follower of Christ, mm -hmm. a disciple of Christ, and not be invested with this important part of his ministry? Amen. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to conclude by saying if it isn't already, 
maybe you've had some aha moments mm -hmm. in this and said, yeah. well, I need to be a little bit more giving and a little less stingy. Mm. If it isn't already, let us each make it our purpose to dedicate a portion of our income to the needs of the less fortunate. And we can yeah. talk about other ways we can help the less fortunate. There are lots of ways. Sure. And oftentimes it's flipped. It's like, don't just give money, give of yourself. And that's mm -hmm. true. But in this case, don't just give of yourself. Yeah. yeah. We all could have something like, I would dare say most of the people in this country mm -hmm. uh, can have something that, that can help those less fortunate. So sure. uh, why don't you read for us that concluding statement? This is sure. Friday's lesson, last paragraph from Desire of Ages 639. As you open your door to Christ's needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming unseen angels. You invite the companionship of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praises upon their lips and an answering strain is heard in heaven. Every deed of mercy makes music there. The Father from his throne numbers the unselfish workers among his most precious treasures. Mm. Powerful thought. And I'm sure grounds for great conversation in every local Sabbath school, but our time is up, so as we close, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to know you and by your grace minister as you did to those in need. Help us to not only wait for them to come to us, but look for those opportunities ourselves Help us to be generous in spirit and sacrificial in giving that we, Lord, not only can help others, but by your grace develop that Christ-like character that we need to be part of your kingdom. So bless us to that end, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.